War, what is it good for? And is there hope after trauma? Yes, it's right, we'll be talking about Israel again in books. Cheers. Welcome back everybody to me talking about books and today we'll be talking about Adama by Navitidar. Now a couple of days ago I already talked about Maror because I wanted to deal with that before we go to Adama which came out yesterday and I binge read it in one day. You should not do the same thing or maybe do the same thing. Main point is you should go and read the damn book because it's fantastic. It's probably even stronger than Maror and uh, I'll be telling you all about it after giving you a quick synopsis and then I'll have a bit of a beer. You go and read the book. Or you just listen to me uh, talk about stuff. I will not go too much into spoilers anyway, because wh why do so? <clears throat> and uh, not necessarily, you know, spoilers don't work that well with historical fiction anyway. So that's what we'll do. But the message is, go get Adama, read it. You will learn a lot and it will probably make you cry at some point at least. And, you know, that's a good thing with books. So <laughs> let's do that thing, shall we? All right, so Adama came out yesterday and is the second historical literary fiction novel by Lavi Tidar. It's once again set in Israel. It takes a different approach from Maror. It mostly follows one more or less extended family all the way back from the late 1940s, um, 1946 in particular, through the early 2000s and follows their different life paths, um, mostly centered around one kibbutz in the north of Israel, or well at that point still like the Palestinian territory, uh, the territory of Palestine, and you know all the way to the 2000s, looking at how living in that place, living in, well, a kibbutz, in, a kibbutz with all the special um, things that happen in a kibbutz kind of inf impacts a a family, how it impacts generations, how trauma is carried through generations, how there are attempts to, well, move out of that family, find freedom, find hope, or live according to one's convictions, political convictions, social convictions, and so forth. And through all of that, you'll learn a lot more about, you know, that country that's over there and um, how it is maybe unique, just like all other countries are unique. And also how, you know, sometimes countries are played with or are used in the larger game that is global politics, um, or maybe in this case, for example, the Cold War and stuff like that. It's once again, well, it's a family saga. It's a historical novel. Its scope is vast. Uh, it's incredibly dense um, when it comes to just like action, like the, the the prose, which is excellent. But it is obviously it packs a lot into these like almost four hundred pages, um, compared to you know, can follow takes thousands of pages to tell this. Is my point here, um, when it just comes to the the density of events and um, emotions and so forth. It's it's a it's a wonderful book. It's possibly one of Lavitidar's strongest, in my opinion, and yeah, you should go and read it, um, broaden your horizon. It's very much necessary when we talk about areas like the Middle East. We should probably all go and read more fiction, because it can give us insights that the news coverage will never give us. So yeah, do yourself a favor, get it, read it, and I'll have a bit of a beer, and then we'll talk about some of the larger aspects, doing some interpreting, interpretation, um, and waffling around it. All right, so I'm glad you're back and you read the book, obviously. Let's talk about <clears throat> what this book does and why I think it works so well. There is a saying that was very powerful, well, very popular in the 1960s and early 70s, that is, the private is political and the political is private. It's, you know, one of those uh, things that are important. I truly believe that is the case. And I think this book is a good example of showing why and how that is, how you can't actually separate politics, party politics, uh, global politics, whatever, from the impact they have on families, on our private lives, uh, how our private choices are also always political choices. And um, I think this book does show all of that in a lot of ways. So I just wanted to start out my discussion with uh, this sentiment. If you don't believe that you're A, wrong, B, you should at least entertain the idea, read the book or other books and see where the point comes from, all right? So let's start with that. And then let's look at the setup of the novel. As I said, it's about, well, basically one family, um, two sisters, one brother that all live through the 1930s and early 1940s, 
they're a Jewish family from Hungary, from Budapest, and it follows these three different narratives. And we'll go back to that in a second. And, well, what comes after that, their, you know, children, their children's children, and so forth all the way to four generations, with the last generation being Hannah, who lives in the U.S. and is kind of dealing with the death of her mother Esther. And um, that's sort of like the opening that we get. It's a bit of a circular, well, elliptical narrative in this regard, something that we might know from, you know, the way people like Stephen Erickson write uh, their novels or their chapters, something you find a lot in, say, short story writing, and short story writing is very much something you can see in this novel as well, because a lot of these um, parts of the novel are more or less structured like their own closed-off narratives that are kind of linked one next to the other to tell these stories. They're interlinking and overlapping, but they're all sort of elliptical in in that way. <clears throat> and it's I think it's a very good way of telling family stories because a lot of family stories, <laughs> they're always coming back to the... It's very easy to make these circular. We're always making our parents mistakes or coming back to these. So that circular, that elliptical structure makes um, Arama work incredibly well in that regard. So that's that's the first part here. Um, now we have these three f parts of the family, and I think they show something very interesting. If you consider Israel as the nation of Israel as a Jewish state, there's different approaches to that state. And a lot of it obviously f comes back to European anti-Semitism and then obviously um, uh, Germany, the Shoah, and all the terrible, well, the, the genocide of the Jew European Jews during World War II. Um, that is, and you, you can't actually separate that from, you know, what, what happened afterwards. But it's also important to understand that it's <laughs> anti-Semitism was big before Germans made it even bigger, is my point here. And you can see that here as well, because one, per well, per one person, Ruth, are arguably main character or the one person that goes throughout the entire story and shows up in all of these individual stories, more or less. Um, well, she moves to Israel before World War II actually starts, in the 30s, as part of the kibbutz um, uh, movement and the Zionist movement in Israel during the 30s where obviously anti-Semitism is rampant in Germany, but if you move, well, you know, it's before things get really terribly bad. They're just terribly bad, without the really, my point. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, whereas her sister Shoshana stays in Budapest and ends up in in the death camp in Auschwitz and um, where her parents die. So that's the th second part, which is um, people that actually survive the death camps survive the Holocaust in Germany, survive the Shoah, where as her their brother, whose name I can't pronounce and also forgot again, um, moved uh, to, uh, well, became politically radicalized early on and left into the Soviet Union and uh, fought apparently as part of the Red Army and then leaves, leaves through Russia when Stalinism becomes Stalinism um, and moves from there to Israel. So you have three three different um, strands of um, people of political or backgrounds, general backgrounds that make up the starting point of the state of Israel. You have the people that have already been there before World War II, before the Shoah. You have the people, you have the survivors, and you have the people that tried to do something else because of their political convictions with Russia, with the Soviet, Soviet Union, with um, the Red Army, and trying to do Stalinism or communism in, organized communism in Europe, and not flee to um, or move to Palestine. So you have these three different ways that come together and that I argue are very important to understand the situation, the early situation in the state of Israel in the 50s, 40s, 50s and 60s. And I think that's that's one important aspect to see here. They also are, um, well, show three different approaches to, I guess, um, what, what I would call as an outsider, part of like Jewish identity or um, Israeli identity in that part of history. You have the true believers that believe that uh, Palestine or Israel is the the land made for Jews, the place where where their future lies, and fight for that with all possible options. That's Ruth. You have people that are just trying to get somewhere where they have peace and can live in freedom and peace and so forth, which is Shoshana's way when she moves to, uh, to the US later on, because, you know, life in Israel in the 60s is not necessarily going to be all, you know, all, all of a paradise. So you have these people 
the, 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 the full-on trauma survivors that just want to have peace. And you have people who see Israel just as one part of a larger general uh, political field, which is um, their brother who remains a Soviet spy in Israel, which will lead us obviously to the next important part here, which is that a country like Israel, and this, this I think is important to understand as well, is like the territory of Palestine, now Israel, that, that part of the Middle East has been a key piece in global politics for a long time. It's been, you know, colonized by the, <laughs> and I've been, a, you know, suffering from imperialism all the way back to, you know, the <laughs> when Alexander the Great first went through there and then the Romans took it over. And it moves over to, you know, at some point the Ottomans take it from uh, different other groups. Um, the Crusaders go there. The, yeah, the Ottomans take it over. Then the British take it over from the Ottomans. This area has always been part of imperial power plays all through history. And that does not stop once the, uh, once the state of Israel is established. And I think this is one of the, um, the interesting aspects that kind of get hinted at here. We obviously see um, the um, <clears throat> way the British treat the, uh, the Jewish settlers in the 1940s with the harassment and oppression that Ruth and Dove and those people um, suffered before, well, the Nakba and the, uh, the what, depending on how you want to call it, independence, war for independence, um, that time in the 48s, the way the the British are treating both refugees that are coming, that are newly coming to Israel, to to Palestine, and obviously people that are already there, how they are treated and oppressed by the by the imperial and colonial overlords, those being the British, because they still see this as their country to um, to use for whatever things they are trying to use there, uh, do there. Um, that's the first part, but we also see that later on when we, on the one hand, have uh, people like you know the Soviet Union trying to use. Um, the uh, the state of Israel in in the Cold War power play of, of you know those two blocks against the capitalist or U.S. led block on the other hand and we see that in the episodes around the 1950s the the shooting of the movie the way um so you know Soviet agents are trying to gain gain power you know leverage leverage against American artists or at least use these American artists in those power ploys to use um the, well to fight capitalism basically so the state of Israel remains while being its own uh, nation at this point, it's, uh, it still remains part of that global power play, which then once again, you end uh, up when Israel turns clearly to the capitalist West um, in all the wonderful things, well, not wonderful things we see, for example, in the story of Maror, and here as well, when it comes to smuggling drugs, uh, dealing with the CIA, dealing with Americans, which is where a large part of this narrative ends, when the kibbutz um, sells out partly at least to an American uh, company. So we see this this history, this tradition of this area, you know, you can probably go through geography to figure out why that is the case, but like that area of the Mediterranean coast, the, uh, that part of the Middle East has a continuous history of being just a plain piece in global politics and imperial politics, no matter whether it's its own sovereign nation or not. <clears throat> and um, we obviously see this um, tie into, you know, the family history there as well. Now, the next part is, of course, um, the family part. This is a family story and a family saga, which I think makes it work better than Maror, because there are more personal inter interpersonal connections between all the characters in this story than there were with the um, mostly friendships and so forth, or partly family, of course, in, in Maror. Because we see how these different convictions, these different reasons that drove people, uh, the, the characters here, to the land of Palestine and Israel, how they these kind of interlock and how these shape the people and how these different trauma, because let's face it, Surviving the Shoah is obviously one of the worst traumas ever that you can imagine, but going through the War of Independence there, but also going, you know, through um, the 1930s there, having people live in, in or hoping you still have family left in Europe, that's also traumatic. Um, surviving um, <clears throat> surviving World War II on the Soviet side is highly traumatic. We have all these different aspects of trauma. The different ways our convictions, or in this case, these characters' convictions, their beliefs are tested and broken again and again. 
and which leads to these different reactions, how people interact with, with their children, perpetuate, uh, perpetuate trauma or don't perpetuate trauma, which is where the generational level comes in. We see and I think it's important to see how this, uh, why this is set on a kibbutz. Now, there may be personal reasons because Lavi Tidar obviously grew up on a kibbutz, but it's also interesting to see that idea, the 1930s, the, the idealistic um, aspect of this, of creating a new society, creating a better society. There's, you know, a lot of these ideas of how to create better societies in the 1920s, 1930s, the whole early 20th century. A lot of this has alternative lifestyle has kind of fallen to the wayside. When you go back to Ian MacDonald's Hopeland that I recently talked about, that also talks about a different approach to society that's not as radical as the kibbutz, but definitely also goes down that direction. And hope and MacDonald's obviously set that in the 1920s and 1930s as well, because that's kind of where these things come from. But it also shows how these alternative ideas of how to build a new, a better society, how these are driven by people that um, have to constantly balance like their own personal happiness, their own personal satisfaction with the larger political, which is where that personal and political engages. We see that in particular with someone like Ruth, who on the one hand clearly loves her first son, but also cannot obviously show too much love because the idea is that, you know, all children are growing up in a commun communal system. They are not supposed to call their parents mom or dad, or they are just supposed to call them by their names because there is that idea of creating a more um, egalitarian um, uh, communist society within the kibbutz. And we see how that impacts this as well because these two aspects of the personal and the political are always intermingling here. And we obviously see that um, a lot of the stress continues from generation to generation because each generation in this book has their own war. You have the War of Independence all the way into the 50s, where we have some very dark chapters um, describing obviously what you might uh, what you can call war crimes by um, Jews against Arabs living in that same area. There's a lot of that in some part, and it's not blinking or um, not looking away from these, which I think is important to understand, because these things are part of that land, which has, you know, the title Adama, which means homeland or land, and the saying that you can't say that without saying dam, which means blood. This is very much about, like, pouring yourself into a country up to a point, and all of that kind of builds that that place, that feeling of time and place that is so important here. <clears throat> However, as I said, <laughs> each generation has their war. Then there's, of course, um, the Six-Day war, uh, six war later on, which is the next one for the next generation. And younger children then have to fight in the Yom Kippur War. Um, the next generation has to go to Lebanon in the Lebanon War in the early 80s, <clears throat> one that is obviously covered in far more detail in Maror, but it's also in here. It's like each generation has their own war. And that does, no matter what, you, what else you say, that does have a huge impact on a country, on, on a family. Each generation has to deal with the trauma of their parents and their grandparents, but they also encounter their own trauma when they fight their own wars. And the question is, of course, always, is there any way of actually finding peace? Is there a way to, get, to do that? And the answer is here very dark in in Adama, because at the end of the day, the people that get away are the people that leave the country, that leave the political completely behind and decide to focus on the private as much as possible. That's the people that, that just can't stand it anymore and leave. And I think it's important to be aware of that, because while the private and the political are the same, that is exhausting. It's, it, it takes a toll, depending on what you can do, and sometimes quitting is the only option, which is why Shoshana, who is probably the most broken person, obviously, in this book, leaves to America. She just doesn't want to do that anymore. It's why why Esther, at some point, leaves to the S, because it's it's too much energy, it's too much power. It's, probably, it's also why Ofek leaves um, his um, kibbutz and uh, moves somewhere else, and we don't even know where. I think it's important to understand that, that sometimes the only way is to just leave. Whereas, on the other hand, a lot of most people that are actually, you know, um, staying within the system have bad endings. Most of these people die violent deaths, um, except for Ruth, whose ending we don't really know. And I think this, this once again, is, is an important aspect of this, to see that trauma keeps on piling up. And the, the thing that we need in these situations, and I can't speak for we in this case because I'm obviously not from there, um, 
But the thing that is needed is a way to heal and not to just keep holding on to old grudges, to keep compounding these traumas and perpetuating them all the time. The goal should be healing up to a point. And I think that's that's the larger message that we can find at the end there. And now this will be the, the two main spoilery things that I have to say about this, which are, of course, um, the last two chapters. Last Ruth chapter, which deals with her once again finding... <clears throat> Nathan Deutsch, the person who um, possibly, who, well, sold out her family to the Nazis in the 40s, um, whom she kept and tortured for a while, and then <clears throat> other people let him go, or Shoshana let him go, her sister let him go. But, you know, seeing him come back to Israel in the late 1990s, in the mid-1990s, seeing that happen, and at that point her mind, well, whether it's um, Alzheimer's or some other form of, you know, just growing incredibly old, but th though the one thing that keeps her alive, that keeps her going, is that hatred for people that hurt her, hurt her family, that n constant need to keep fighting and keep everything personal away as much as possible, because she does not find that balance between the political and the personal either. Right? The one thing that is left is that personal political hatred that is mixed up, and her going on that drive to Tel Aviv to kill him once and for all, and being completely, well, completely forgetting where she is, who she is, and, um, yeah, being lost in that city because the world has moved on. The world has passed her by, and she's holding on to these old grudges in a way that is incredibly harmful. But you can't actually tell people to leave go <laughs> let go of their traumata. That's not how that works. So it's understandable, but it's also sad, and there is no, there is no happy ending there for her. And I think that's... That's just what make what definitely killed me when I read it last night. It made me cry immediately because it's so so dark, it's so brutal, and it's yeah. There are no good answers, is the point here. But there is obviously maybe a happy end, sort of, almost, possibly in the future, which is obviously Hannah, who then drives to LA um, after Esther's death uh, to maybe reconnect with her ex girlfriend Alex and at least go out for a coffee and find some form of, uh, well, leaving trouble behind, of reconnecting, of building up some trust for the future, some hope. It's not in the book, which I think would be too, far too much, but it, there is that hope that maybe, maybe if we move on far enough and leave too much, far enough, you know, enough of the past behind us, then maybe, maybe it'll work. Just maybe. And I think that's that's as much hope as you can find in here. However, I, I as I said, it, it's a moving story because all of these characters have their own re motivations to go down the different roles. All of them are trying to find happiness. All of them are trying to build a better world, build a better future. And it's it's the world from outside. It's it's the US and the Soviet Union not letting the country be. It's all these other elements that come in there that making make this such a, well, pressure cooker in a way, like the state of Israel is such an emotional political pressure cooker in so many ways that it's, yeah, is there ever a chance for this to work out? And I think while there may be ways, it, it's not telling you what these will be. Mostly what it asks for, I think, is, well, compassion, understanding, and empathy for the people that are caught in these situations. And I think that's all you can get there. Now, one or two things that I found just nice are obviously connections to Maror. There are two, three mentions here that make sense. Well, Cohen, the cop, shows up once and is mentioned a second time. Benny, who I suppose will be the same Benny as uh, the gangster from Maror, um, is has one or two uh, connections or one or two phone calls. And, of course, um, there are mentions to the um, at least one of the uh, murders that Cohen and... Um, Eddie Raphael try to solve in the beginning of Maror here as well, but beyond that, you can read these two novels completely independent from one another. I think this one may be a bit more accessible um, because the focus on one family makes it more focused, more e well, makes it easier to get along. Plus, it does not rely as much on certain events that are probably just known to people people within Israel that have experience, have experienced them. The main historical events that are mentioned here are much more well-known, I think, which makes it a bit more accessible for those who really, really feel lost when they don't recognize every reference and every um, historical event mentioned in a story. But, as I said, this is a powerful story. It's a powerful book that 
can once again help us understand a place that most of us have very little to no understanding, that most of us have very little experience of, and while I don't think Israel is in any way special, more special than other places, there's a lot of places out there where we can really, really benefit from knowing more about them through the medium of fiction, through the medium of these kind of stories. And once again, each of these individual novellas, parts, whatever you want to call them, that make up the larger story are in themselves wonderfully well-detailed and um, composed crime fictions, mostly crime thriller sort of stories. And I think that once again also works really well, as does in this case the returning to the same song, the same folk song of the winds blowing through the cypress trees that is brought up in almost each of these stories. See where Maror showed, used different um, periods of culture, different songs through the ages to show how times changed, how things changed over time, how the feelings of people changed, how the atmosphere of the country changed with the different styles of music, different movies and so forth. This one always comes back to the same thing. And I think this is a powerful message, how, how that war for independence, the 1930s and 1940s, are still very much haunting, very much haunting the society. It's that return to that one movie, The, the Vultures, which was filmed on that kibbutz. It's also the return to that one uh, song of the settlers and, um, well, rebels, whatever you want to call them at the time. Uh, it always comes back to that. And it's about losing, or maybe not losing, but finding a way to move forward in a probably dignified way, not actually, you know, doing anything terrible or tarnishing the memory of the people that helped create the country and build the country and so forth, but finding a way to move on because, well, hatred's not a good basis to build a country on, neither is trauma, and you need to find other ways. So this is why I think it's, in a way, it could be a hopeful book, but mostly I just hope people read it and enjoy it and learn more about a place because understanding a place's history, understanding the emotions that go into a place um, can help us understand and possibly find ways to move on. And move on is something we really need to do. These are my thoughts on Adama by Lavi Tidor. I hope you enjoyed the book. I hope you enjoyed my thoughts. Um, if you haven't read the book yet and uh, still feel like reading it, please do. It's well worth it. I'll definitely reread it. Um, if you liked what I did here, I don't know, like, subscribe, share it. Do those things. Um, if you want to support me in, like, actual, you know, monetary ways, monetary ways. There's some links down there below. I could certainly do it, but, you know, mostly talk to me about the book. Talk to me. It's, it's, it's what I really appreciate. And, um, yeah, wish you a great day, and I'll talk to you very soon. Thanks, and cheers.